Good afternoon. A very warm and hearty welcome to our distinguished guests and, of course, to our special guest today, Aig Bodje Aig Igmoebe. So I've known Aig for many years. Actually, the first time we met was at a, an event in uh, 2007 in uh, Abuja, where else but the uh, Hilton Transcorp. And uh, I remember our editor at the time, Anwar Versi, interviewing Aig for the second issue of African Banker magazine. So my name is Omar Ben Yedda. I'll be here to take you through the book launch of a great book that uh, I finished reading last week. It's called Leaving the Tarmac by uh, our guest uh, of honor today, uh, Mr. Agboje Ikmoede, and it's about buying a bank in Africa, but it's much more than that, actually. The book is very readable. Uh, I found the style I, very uh, accessible to bankers and non-bankers, actually, and uh, it was very clear, concise. It was, uh, I mean, the, the way I describe it, it's a, it's a playbook for anyone, anyone wanting to grow a successful enterprise. Uh, also, what I enjoyed about it, obviously, I was there since, uh, well, I've been at the group since 2003. I've been following the Nigerian story since, uh, since then. And, uh, and the banking story was uh, a fascinating one. Uh, yeah, and uh, people who read the book will, will be able to find out why. But uh, you recount a number of incidents and uh, years that I followed closely. And um, so, yeah, so it, was, uh, so it was a very easy read. I found it uh, enjoyable. It wasn't uh, full of jargon. On the contrary, uh, you explained things in a uh, very, uh, very matter of fact way, which makes it uh, accessible, as I said. And um, yeah, and it was, a pleasant, uh, it was a pleasant read. I read it during Ramadan when my uh, belly was hungry, but it's, uh, you, still got me, you still kept me captivated. Uh, and actually, I'll, I'll get to some points in terms of what I think the book could have done more, but uh, where the book would have, could have gone further, but we'll talk about that in a second. Well, first of all, I'd like to ask you one question, actually. You mentioned it a little bit in your introduction. It's about uh, the lack of books written by Africans, uh, and especially the, the lack of, I mean, in fiction, we're seeing, a, uh, we're seeing a great renaissance of African writing. But in terms of the business and in terms of uh, African thinking, there's a lack of African managed business and management books. I mean, you cr you quote uh, Sefa Patti in your book on, uh, and I will read that. Uh, I'll read. I will read. You make me want to read his book on Nigerian banking sector. But there are there are few good business books on Africa by Africans. So uh, what got you to uh, to write a book? Why did you Why did you decide to write a book? Thank you, Omar, and um, thank you to your publication for hosting this uh, discussion. Uh, and indeed, actually, um, as you spoke, I, I, I look back at the fact that uh, you had a front row seat to my um, chapters of the Access Bank story. And uh, I believe you are still covering that story because uh, my successor, you know, Herbert is doing a great job, you know, uh, with his chapters. Um, why, why, why don't we have uh, more books and more stories like mine. The first thing, of course, is that, uh, and it's, you know, it's unfortunate that we don't have that many stories of African business unicorns. Um, and uh, of course, that comes down to uh, the state of um, economies across Africa, which in itself can, you know, um, boils down to poor economic management. But, you know, nonetheless, we do have stories. And I wrote this book um, in a sense to kickstart this culture of Africans telling their stories uh, so that, you know, the world can see that Africans, when given the opportunity, can do what citizens across uh, any, any country in the world can achieve. There is this uh, great book that I read by a guy called uh, Reginald Lewis. And, you know, uh, in it, he, in fact, this is what he titled his book. In it, you know, he was asked the question, you know, about um, his, uh, his drive for, for success. And uh, this is the reason why he wrote the book. He said, why should white guys have all the fun? That's the title of the book. Uh, and so, you know, I'm challenging um, African businessmen, you know, to do great things and have fun whilst they do it. Great. Uh, look, in terms of the book, as I said, it's very clear. It's also very methodical, which is, uh, which is a good thing about it. You mentioned, and we'll talk about it, but you mentioned risk, governance, and lots of, uh, and lots of other issues, including integra integrating uh, two banks into, uh, into one. 
But, um, and, you know, when people look at entrepreneurs, they sort of see where they are today and they say, okay, yes, oh, this is easy. Yes, I can do this. But ultimately, I mean, there's one thing maybe, I mean, you do discuss it a little bit, but you'd obviously been gearing up to this. You didn't just wake up one day and say, I want to buy a bank. You'd obviously been preparing yourself mentally for maybe 10, 15 years before this big moment where you bought access back in 2001, 2002. So you'd obviously been gearing up and preparing for, for, for this moment for a while. So can you maybe talk to us about mentally what you're going through as you're going through your career in your early days uh, within banking after studying law? So, um, you know, my career in banking actually started as a lawyer, as a corporate counsel in a bank. And I write about that in, in my book. Uh, what I don't really disclose is that uh, even as a, a, an intern, postgraduate um, intern, what we call the national one year of uh, youth service, compulsory youth service, I worked at Chase, which was then called Continental Merchant Bank. And uh, as a youth corp, I remember writing an opinion on, you know, on some uh, banking issue. Uh, now, youth corpers weren't allowed to sign off on opinions. Only the managers uh, of the businesses were allowed to do that type of thing. And so my opinion was signed off and penned by my manager, my boss, uh, the head of the legal department. And it, you know, it was circulated as our opinions tended to be circulated around the whole bank. And a gentleman called Fola Adeola made this comment on that opinion. He said, this is the best legal opinion I have seen or come across you know, uh, in my banking career. And my boss was kind enough to point out the fact that uh, I didn't write it. You know, there's this, you know, this youth call intern who wrote that. All I'm pointing out here is that, look, uh, if, you, if in everything you do, you, you pursue excellence, um, you prepare yourself for that moment when you, know, uh, you will be thrust in a position of responsibility where you can discharge it. Um, I felt, uh, and so did Herbert, that in all honesty, we were prepared to run a bank. And we'd been doing and preparing ourselves for literally you know, the better part of our, our careers. So I, when, I, when I tell um, uh, an audience you know, about the most important thing for leadership, it's preparation. And life is much easier when you are prepared. You know? um, the reason why uh, a heavyweight boxer you know, goes into the ring and emerges, or anybody emerges, you know, victorious, you, you know, usually boils down to preparation. And uh, I'm happy that you, uh, that you mentioned both Foller, Foller from, I believe, GT Bank, uh, which is a bank that you also uh, speak about uh, quite fondly in your book, but, uh, but ultimately Herbert. So uh, I don't want to call him partner in crime because you weren't involved in criminal activities, but uh, your partner and your, your, I don't want to say soulmate, but uh, obviously, I mean, you know, in one chapter, you say that uh, the, uh, the, uh, the work had taken its toll. You were involved in, uh, in raising capital for the bank uh, and you were working incessantly for, for many years leading up to this moment as well. That uh, that he actually had, you were you were hospitalised for uh, for some time and he actually gave you some blood so uh, so uh, he contributed to, uh, to 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 your well being so uh, so you guys are sort of you know brothers separated at birth but you talk about what I want to speak about really is the importance of Herbert to you and to taking that step from being a bank employee to say okay I'm gonna go by my I'm gonna go by myself or with a, with a partner I'm gonna have a crack at this. And you talk about, you know, four eyes are better than two. You mentioned it a few times in your, uh, in your, in your book, the sort of the four eyes strategy. So how important it, was it to have uh, someone like Herbert? And do you think, in terms of your advice to entrepreneurs, is it best to go on, a, on an adventure with someone else so that he's got your back and you've got his? So uh, thanks, Omar. Um, H Herbert and I built a professional friendship. We didn't know we were building it with any particular venture in mind. I think the, um, the common uh, thread uh, running through our lives was that in, you know, we were both you know, children, uh, civil service children, as we called it. You know, our parents came from the civil service. We, came, we lived a similar uh, uh, you know, adolescent experience. He went to school in the north. I went to school in the north. Both in these elite uh, federal uh, secondary schools. Um, 
uh, and we both found ourselves in, in banking. Um, from a professional standpoint, I think um, I said, I said, you know, uh, particularly people we work with that we share the same DNA. Um, simply by that, I meant the fact that our default, salt, our default setting for excellence for achievement is excellence. I mean, we both share that. And so um, we had many common points by which we could, re you know, resolve issues between friends. Now, when it comes to the Access Bank story, I was given a book by my late brother-in-law when I was in Harvard for three months. He had just finished his and a Harvard MBA uh, um, uh, alumni uh, as well. And, um, um, you know, we, in the book, okay, it told me that there are two paths for somebody like me. One is to continue what I was doing. The other is to go off and take a more entrepreneurial position in life. I chose to take the entrepreneurial path, but I then had experienced, you know, working with Fola and Tayo. And I could see um, uh, in the banking context, especially how the, uh, the notion of co two heads, four eyes, seemed to, you know, uh, beat, you know, every competitor who operated singly, okay? And I, I mean, those lessons were not lost on me. And so when I decided to own bank, I chose to adopt that model. Uh, to the decision was based fun, f fundamentally on competence and the ability for this partner to continue to run even if I was hit by a bus and no longer able to drive this, this dream. Uh, the second uh, um, uh, uh, condition, of course, was that there was alignment. And so the fact that, you know, Herbert and I were great friends helped that alignment. It's very difficult to find somebody who is who meets all your competence criteria and your alignment criteria. That, I think, is God, and that's not me. Um, uh, and I'm saying this um, uh, uh, in symbiotic terms. For Herbert and for, my, and for me, in terms of our experience together, you know, it's almost impossible to find that type of com combination in terms of where you are great friends and you, you, know, you believe fully in each other's competence. Now, I only add that to people who say, okay, fine, this is the model they want to pursue, and therefore you're looking for um, this Ike Herbert type of combination. You may not find that. You may, uh, but it's not going to be easy. Um, but speaking to the issue of going off on your own, um, if you are not the type of person who knows how to do uh, somebody else, then our partnership model is not for you. However, every every entrepreneur and every business that is built needs partnerships your partnerships may not be as intense as ours but i can assure you you will need partnerships and um at the end of the day the the rules to building great partnerships are the same whether it's the type of partnership that herbert and i enjoy or it's going to be more of a federated uh, uh um less intense type of relationship that you have with your partners, whoever they may be. And the golden rule is simply this. Partnerships are like gardens. The more you nurture them, the more you put into them, the greater they flourish. And like gardens, when, you know, uh, you become too busy, too distracted, or whatever, or too tired to nurture your garden, you know what happens. Same thing happens in partnerships. Okay, fantastic. Look, in the, at the beginning of the book, you also mentioned how your mom couldn't believe that you would be buying a bank. And, uh, and it's, uh, I mean, I, I find it very interesting, actually, because I didn't know the whole history of the merchant bank and the, uh, and, and the retail banks and also the whole sort of godfather. Um, you had to have a godfather behind, uh, behind a bank to, uh, to support you, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, uh, so that's, uh, that's fantastic. Uh, insights there but uh, what i want to discuss really is you know you bought uh, and at the time people people see the nigerian banking system today they see these great banks uh, that are performing very well and, uh, and they're seeing uh, competitive competitive competition between 20 banks or so but at the time uh, when you purchased the bank there were sort of 100 or so banks uh access was uh, languishing in the bottom quartile so i think number 70 or so 
And uh, you obviously had ambitions to be a top 10 bank within five years. And um, and you talk about, you went on numerous retreats to work out your USP, you know, how can we compete with the top banks? What, what can we offer that they don't do? And you talk about this very interesting concept called uh, value chain banking, uh, which I hadn't heard before actually. And, uh, and you also mentioned a great anecdote about MTN and how you helped MTN grow. So obviously these were glorious, glorious days to some extent, obviously it's easy to romanticize about the past, but obviously we had, you know, uh, a, a new democratic government, the end of the military regime. We had uh, some sort of super cycle in terms of commodities, thanks to uh, Chinese growth. We had the telecoms boom. And, uh, and you're gonna to talk to us a little bit about this sort of this banking uh, consolidation. But really what I'm interested in is how did you work with MTN and tell us a little bit about value chain banking and uh, how you uh, how you managed to develop it. Well, thanks, Omar. I mean, you, you set up the the context for the very well. Remember that, you know, MTN, even though a new company, all right, in Nigeria was already this African success story. And they were very discriminating in their choice of bankers and they knew exactly what they wanted and they, they were very, very uh, strict in terms of terms, etc. So here was Access Bank. Very, very limited branch network. Very limited capital. Very limited liquidity. Okay. And therefore, you know, what, what in God's name could we do for MTN. Um, and uh, this reality is what caused us to focus on something that would be of comparative advantage to us. We knew that when it came to the understanding of serving a customer and, if you like, uh, strong analytical capabilities of, you know, various sectors and then an experience, you know, of playing intimately with the leaders of those sectors to understand their pains, et cetera, as they build their companies. One thing we knew that we could do is that we could, you know, uh, come from a completely uh, uh, different perspective in talking to our customers. And so our, our, our pitch simply was like this. See, MTN, we know that we are not on the top 10, top 20, top 30, top 40 lists, or top 50 lists of banks you should be dealing with. But there's one reason why we should be on your list, which is this. We will understand, we will study your business and understand it as well as you do. And we will share with you exactly how to overcome weaknesses in your business, largely from a finance and banking standpoint. But if we went beyond that, I'm sure you wouldn't mind. And typically, they would look at us. Of course, we had the credibility of having worked in GT and so on. And they'll say, okay, let's see exactly what these guys are, are talking about. So we would deconstruct the entire value chain of MTN. And in doing so, we, we came up with two very, 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 very key issues for MTN. One was the fact that they needed a distributor model that worked for Nigeria. The traditional distributor models that they knew in other African countries was not, it didn't lend itself easily to Nigeria. We don't have malls. Uh, we don't have a retail footprint, you know, as you would have in, in other markets. At that time, obviously you didn't have digital technology that allowed for virtual uh, uh, airtime distribution and so on. So you needed a physical distribution system that works. And so literally we partnered with them, you know, to create distributors, identified school distributors, trained distributors uh, uh, came up with the most dynamic uh, distributor financing package and very quickly became the top uh, bank. The other thing, of course, was the whole issue of, um, of uh, their infrastructure. There are two things that make a good telco. One is, of course, the ability to distribute their airtime, but also fundamentally important is the quality of that airtime. And um, rolling out a national you know, uh, uh, telco uh, infrastructure in Nigeria is not an easy thing to do. It's a large com country. Uh, the, uh, typo uh, the, the, you know, the geology and, of course, the geography of Nigeria, you know, can be very challenging and so on. So uh, we came up with this, again, identified local uh, construction companies who would be on a turnkey basis, go out there and 
and do these rollouts. But of course, they didn't have capital. So we came up with this concept called a sell site in a warehouse. And we had these huge giant warehouses, you know, a supply chain management system where we would import, you know, uh, the components of um, a cell site, generator, steel, uh, and everything you want, okay? And we would release them to these um, uh, uh, local um, uh, contracting companies, okay? Maybe five cell sites at a time. So the risk was limited. So even though there was enough in terms of thousands of cell sites in a warehouse, the risks of failure were managed by us. So, I mean, you can... You can you can understand, you know, how effective this model would be. But Im importantly also, we did not necessarily limit ourselves to the domain of, of finance. And sometimes we found ourselves doing the same type of thing as, you know, a McKinsey or, or Accenture consultant, you know, would do. It turned out to be a winning model. We rolled it out not just for MTN, but across, you know, uh, corporate Nigeria. And it's, uh, I mean, ultimately it's very smart. Today, you know, everyone's speaking about big data, and, uh, and trying to make sense of that big data. But ultimately, that's exactly what you were doing to some extent. I mean, you knew the whole value chain inside out, which means that you could lend to, uh, to some distributors because you knew that you, you understood their credit risk. You also understood what, uh, what, uh, what their revenues would be. So you understood the whole value chain and, uh, and you can develop the, the whole, uh, your whole banking system uh, around that value chain. So it's, uh, it's ultimately smart business as well. Look, if I have one criticism of the book, actually, is that uh, occasionally you leave the reader wanting more. So I understand that, I mean, when you read it, you clearly see that there's no point scoring here. It's not about, you know, saying, oh, I'm better than you. Look at the mistakes that this bank made or that and we did better than them, uh, even though we want a bit more juicy details, of course. But uh, what I mean by that is, uh, for example, you mentioned that following the bank. So we want a bit more detail in terms of maybe some of the mistakes that uh, that you made. So you mentioned that following the banking consolidation, you embarked on a period of very fast growth. That also meant that it was, it was sometimes faster than, than what was practically possible. So uh, you didn't necessarily have the, maybe the human capital to make sure that the excellent that you expected from, your, uh, from all the divisions to, uh, to be pervasive throughout, uh, throughout this fast growth. So what were the mistakes that, uh, that you think you could have uh, not avoided because we all make mistakes and we learn from them? But uh, what were the mistakes from the from, from your period of fast growth that uh, that you endured? Let me put it this way, Omar. And I was talking to a friend of mine, you know, about this. Um, I'm glad that we made the mistakes we did when we did. You will always make mistakes, um, but I guess the most successful um, enterprises or the most successful leaders are those who make big mistakes when they can so that those mistakes don't take them out or take you know or take them down okay so look in a sense all those mistakes right were like um uh, a school of experience okay where the the benefit you get right, from those experiences far outweighs the cost, you know, of those experiences, such that I'll give you an example. Buying a bank in Cote d'Ivoire, and um, which I write about in the book, um, certainly taught us how to buy a bank that is under the watch of a regulator. And if we didn't have that experience, um, it's not likely that um, the risks of the intercontinental uh, acquisition, which were completely transformational for us in Access Bank, you know, um, would have been managed with the degree of success that we managed them. Um, so, um, you know, uh, it's, it's impossible not to make mistakes when you're growing at the rate we were growing. Remember that uh, when we bought Access Bank, essentially, Access Bank had a billion naira of capital, say circa, $10, $10 million of capital. And we uh, injected and uh, recapitalized it to the tune of $10 million. That took it to $20 million of capital in 2002. Two years later, all right, we taken our capital, all right, from $20 million to, in other words, from 2 billion naira to 25, you know, uh, billion uh, naira. In other words, we'd gone you know, from $20 million to 200 
million dollars plus. But let me tell you, two years later, by uh, 2007, we'd gone from $250 million to you know, $1.3 billion. So, you know, capital find, you know, uh, its uses. And when you grow, you know, at that uh, pace, you know, it's not likely that all the uses, you know, will give you the type of return that you, you intended. Fantastic. Look, a quick pause, actually, uh, not to, uh, to my questions, but just, uh, or some housekeeping, should I say. You can uh, find out more information about the book uh, by uh, going to uh, www.leavingthetarmac.com. And there's all the information in terms of uh, purchasing the book and, uh, and uh, everything about it uh, in terms of uh, where you can get it in your, uh, in your different countries. Uh, you mentioned Intercontinental Bank. And uh, if, there's one, if there's one part, actually, in the book where you feel that you suffered, uh, when I say suffered, actually, no, I mean, there are bits where you, you feel that, you know, it was, uh, it was hard work. But uh, the Intercontinental Bank seems to have been a struggle. It wasn't as easy as you anticipated. It seems to have not taken its toll, but it was, uh, yeah, it, it, it sucked energy out of you, uh, possibly even some frustration. Would that be, uh, would that be accurate? Um, frustration in the sense that um, when you are doing, when you do a combination and culture is one of your challenges, I mean, you're dealing with people and um, you are trying to bring, you know, two cultures uh, to work and gel. Uh, and of course, if, you know, if the overall uh, position of the other party is negative, you know, as in all things, in every courtship and every marriage, it's frustrating if your partner, you know, um, isn't coming to the table with the, with the joy and uh, uh, glee that you hoped. Uh, so in that sense, if you want to use the word frustrating, yes. Um, but from the perspective of um, business combinations and so on, We'd already done a three-way um, combination, you know, uh, um, what was um, Marina Bank and what used to be Credit Lyonnais in Nigeria, you know, in 2004, 2005. We'd already acquired a number of banks in East Africa. Um, you know, I, I mentioned Cote d'Ivoire. So I think that if there is one financial institution that has... A, an understanding of how to do inorganic growth. And that's Access Bank. It's, um, Access Bank is the proverbial uh, m and growth machine. Uh, so there were no frustrations to uh, the fact that we already know in m and that you have surprises. So when we get surprises, it's baked in. We, we aren't surprised or faced by that. But like in everything in life, we're human beings. So, you know, um, uh, uh, business combinations are not combinations of numbers. They are combinations of people. And, you know, um, uh, I'm not a robot. Uh, neither is Herbert. Neither is anybody in Access Bank. And so we would love, of course, for it to be uh, seamless all the time. But sometimes it's not. Okay, I'm, I'm happy you mentioned uh, culture. So in your book, you also say that uh, for that first year, and possibly longer, actually, you went on weekend retreats. So... Uh, to the extent that people thought you were some kind of uh, new sect or church, uh, new church that was uh, gathering supporters because you're day all all day and all night. Um, so, um, so you know, so culture was obviously very important to you. Uh, but tell us a little bit about those retreats and about uh, how you strategized to define that culture and to define what what you wanted to be. These are the parts about the Access Bank story that I enjoy the most. And these are the, you know, these are the things that I share in particular with people that I'm, you know, opportuned or privileged to mentor. Um, you see, when I, when I look at human endeavor and I see human beings as a society or as a team or when it's an organization, you know, go beyond what is ever expected and achieve what people describe as the extraordinary, okay? 
I went down to this uh, uh, fantastic team dynamic, this readiness and willingness to almost die for one another. Indeed, actually, when it comes to building countries, okay, and building societies, um, you know, they say that uh, the trees of liberty are watered, you know, um, you know, by the blood of uh, uh, citizens. Um, so you, we went into those retreats every weekend simply to understand each other, to create a common land language, to share blood, uh, not you know, not physically or biologically, but certainly um, in terms of ideas and uh, in terms of an exchange of trust, if you like. Um, and by each time we went, okay, uh, we were we were we were building this, uh, and I love this team, this New Zealand all black type of team culture and dynamic, and it made it difficult to outcompete us. It still makes it difficult to outcompete Access Bank based on the foundations of that one year. Those foundations are very deep and they remain very Look, You also mentioned that you went on a big recruitment drive, ultimately recruiting graduates. And, uh, and I remember in that interview in uh, back in 2007, you said that, uh, that you probably got the most rigorous recruiting program in Nigeria at the time. And, uh, and I, I remember from the interview, my, I remember hearing you and saying, okay, you talked about the Access Academy here. Uh, our editor calls it the Access University and in the book you call it something else. But, uh, but uh, which is, uh, and, and the two points that caught my eye in the book is that you say that you also sent your non-exec directors, so new non-exec directors on courses, so, uh, so that they would also adopt the Access Bank culture and, uh, and standards that, uh, that, uh, that you expect from them. So, uh, so, so even your non-exec directors, you sent them on courses to make sure that, uh, that they were top yes. notch. I mean, thank you. I mean, it was, it was, it became, uh, <laughs> it became uh, stuff of legend, what it means to be a director, just what it means to be, you know, I mean, our, our, our NEDs had an onboarding period of, I think, 90 days. Um, and thereafter, we, we had this curriculum Okay, over the assumption, with the assumption that an NED would be with us for at least with, for 10 years. We had this curriculum that covered everything from banking and finance to sustainability uh, and to even their personal health and well being. Of course, corporate governance and things like that, you know, as well. Um, and it's simple, you know. Um, I just know, not this is not that I believe, I know, and this is, this is held true to be, um, uh, I think. You cannot, this is inviolable. If you invest wisely in people, they will always improve. Okay? Now, if you have recruited the best people and you invest wisely in the best people, then their output is almost uh, without limits, other than, of course, God. So that's the principle. You know, so even if it is a director or an entry level person or even an intern or a, a who who handles a door, you know, in terms of a doorman or whatever, okay, we look for the best and we give them the best in terms of training and exposure. Yeah. One of the questions that's coming up here is uh, from actually uh, the former uh, an executive director at the Afrix and Bank. It says, what is your single most important factor you'll attribute your success? So maybe you can think about that one. But uh, there's one bit, actually, and maybe you can, maybe it answers it. It answers it through this. Uh, but you interviewed every single person that was recruited by Access Bank uh, over the years uh, as a CEO. I mean, in the book, it says 5,000. When I spoke to you uh, offline, you said there's even up to 10,000 people that, that uh, you interviewed personally. So uh, basically, that shows immense attention to detail, ultimately, and uh, making sure that uh, each box is ticked and that we haven't left any stone unturned. 
I mean, what is this? Is this uh, would you say that uh, one of the key uh, factors to you attribute your success to is that uh, obsessional uh, obsessional quest for uh, for perfection or for excellence? Um, I think the most important factor um, is God, the Almighty uh, God. I am a Christian, and I very much believe in His unseen, invisible hand doing wonderful things in my life. Uh, and he still does. Um, there are too many things that happened in our story that were not me, we're not Herbert, we're not, you know, just time and chance, right place, right time, everything comes together. Um, and look, so that has nothing to do with us. So that's fact one. I can assure you that if you are a business person and you have that type of force, you know, behind you, you will write many books. Um, but you know, in everything that I have also read about success um, in uh, human endeavor, there is this uh, overriding drive. Where, okay, it could differ from one person to the other, but the passion um, that is pushing this person, whatever it is, man or woman, okay, all right, uh, has to be uh, of such fervor that they are almost ready to die for their cause. And was I? Yes. Did I almost die? Yes. And thank God I'm still here with you. Okay. You did, you did. So uh, look in the bank, people who, don't, who haven't followed Nigerian banking, I mean, uh, I think it was 2004, the uh, central bank governor brings in all the bank CEOs to, I don't know if it was Lagos or Abuja, but anyway, gathers all these bank CEOs and tells them that uh, they need to have a minimum capital of uh, 25 billion naira uh, by the end of December 2005. So basically, uh, he the theory was that if Nigeria is going to develop, it needs big banks that's going to support its development. But also, you obviously wanted to uh, get rid of those banks that weren't uh, that weren't performing, and uh, and uh, and it's what people call the great banking consolidation. In your book, you uh, you praise the central bankers for their role, Professor Saludo at the time, but also uh, before him uh, and uh, and after him, Lamida Sanusi, and uh, before him, I forgot the, um, it's another- Joseph Sanusi, so yeah, Joseph Sanusi, yeah. Saludo, and then Lamido Sanusi. That's right, yeah. And, uh, but you said, uh, I mean, one statistic that, uh, that stood out, you said that it was one of the most, efficient consolidations that had taken place anywhere in the world, costing 1% of GDP. So uh, so what does that mean exactly, sorry? So ho hold on, are we talking about um, uh, Chukuma Soludo, right? That's right, yeah. Okay, all right. So basically when you look at a consolidation, a banking consolidation effort, particularly one, okay, that is addressing the issue of, um, uh, risk, systemic risk. So, it could be about alignment between the banking system and the economic demands of the country. But many a time, uh, banking consolidation is propelled not by uh, economic growth, which is what Soludo was after, uh, and Obasanjo, by the way, uh, who wrote it in the forward to my book, but um, uh, in this case, there were two, two things that they sought to achieve. And the first was that with 90 odd banks, okay, the ability for the regulator to properly supervise semi-fragmented uh, uh, industry was very expensive, to be honest. I mean, every bank, however small, needs a certain quantity of bank examiners, et cetera, et cetera. Banking, the Central Bank Board of Governors will review every bank's uh, financials and will re receive reports on each one, et cetera. And look, listen, I mean, doing that for 80 odd banks that um, really have no true uh, impact or relevance or contribution in economic terms can, can be a very costly exercise. So this is, you know, one of the, one of the reasons for consolidation. The other one, of course, is that, you know, when you have uh, several small players, okay, Contagion risk is actually, strangely enough, higher than when you have a defined number of uh, fairly large players. And that may be the uh, antithesis of, you know, the think of too big to fail. No, but the issue is this, all right? When you have several small players, 
a run on several small players is easy to occur and is easy to transfer to the big players because it magnifies the risk of the industry in the minds of the public. So when the public hear that this bank is distressed, that bank is distressed, turn around, turn around, this bank is that in terms of the percentage of deposits, etc., that all these banks represent, it's not material. So again, these are some of the reasons why you know uh, they embarked on it. But clearly, the principal reason was they needed banks that could drive Nigeria's growth story, you know, clearly successful. So what I was speaking to was the fact that typically consolidation has a cost to be met by taxpayers or the regulator, typically. Um, and this is simply because um, you those banks that couldn't consolidate, and of course, you're going to have to pay out depositors and so on. Uh, or, or the other thing that you might have to do is that you might actually have to give incentives, you know, to others, you know, to acquire or consolidate, you know, to acquire them. And in this case, um, uh, the banks that were were uh, taking over where, you know, the cost of it was, you know, a fraction of GDP. Okay, okay, makes sense. Look, I'm going to talk about uh, Nigeria leadership to some extent as well, education as well. I'm, I know time is, uh, time is short, but anyway, one, you know, you've got this academy, you're training, uh, you're training people, you're trying to raise the bar, but uh, e even then, you said in your book, you write that you are worried that the culture of mediocrity that was pervasive in daily life in Nigeria threatened to bring your ideals down. I mean, the, the pervasive in daily life in Nigeria, that's me. But you said the culture of, my, of mediocrity threatened to bring your ideals down. So, uh, so A, how do we change this? And how do we you know, change this culture at a national level and, uh, and make sure that mediocrity doesn't become pervasive in, the, in our daily lives and bring us all down? Well, I'm going to take um, a bit of time in responding to this question, simply because this is very, very important to me. Very, very important to me. So look, I was born in Ibadan, in the southwest of Nigeria, okay, um, to um, civil servants. I was born in the university teaching hospital. Um, it was one of the best hospitals in Africa or the world at the time. Uh, the doctors who, who oversaw my, the process some of the best doctors in the world at the time, okay? And um, I wasn't the child of royalty. I wasn't the child of um, a wealthy uh, individual or, in, you know, I was just simply the child of ordinary Nigerians. So I point to, you know, the Nigeria I knew at birth. And I love history, okay? Uh, and the history that I've read, and I've read parliamentary uh, proceedings uh, in, in, in the UK at the time of independence. Our civil service was described in several debates, not one or this is over time, pre and immediately after independence, by MPs, by civil servants. They speak about Nigeria that they've interacted with in our civil service at that time. I'm talking about pre-60. And they speak about them in terms of clearly knowing that the permanent, the senior civil servant in Nigeria at the time could be a senior civil servant in the best British, in the in British civil service was the best civil service, okay? In uncles and aunties that I knew, whether biological or non-biological, who were writers, wrote books that sold in their hundreds of thousands. The artists I knew, you know, would have kings and queens commission them to do, uh, you know, uh, works on them, okay? This is the Nigeria I knew. The soldiers in Nigeria were the most sought after when it came to the United Nations trying to intervene. So that's the Nigeria I knew. I went to a, a, a government secondary school, which was as good as any secondary school education as you would find anywhere in the world for the first three years. And then all of a sudden, if I use my school experience, case after three years it just went just went spiraling downwards now i'm not saying that corruption started around about 78 79 
when I talk about the fact that my school just went to the dogs from this top, you know, top elite institution to this really, really uh, overpopulated. You know, anyway, I don't want to go into that. Now, right? The root of this downward spiral it's the greatest excuse to throw merit out of the window. And I spoke to you about my own default setting for achievement. It's high, it's excellence. Corruption causes us to reduce our default setting and our expectations even as a people. All right? And so reducing them and reducing them until you get to zero. And that is the, essentially the process that leads to a failed state. And so, you know, this is the reality of building uh, an access bank in that type of environment. And we said, let's create this oasis of sanity where our people come. And when you come into access bank, when you come to work, you know, you are transported out of this uh, sorry story, okay, into uh, an environment where we are pursuing excellence just like you would have it anywhere else in the world. But of course, the problem was that, you know, at some point in time, people have to go home. And when they leave the office and they drive back <laughs> into that traffic, you know, we, they leave our oasis of sanity. Um, why is this very important to me? Because um, if we give up, if we allow this corruption effect leading to mediocrity, you know, take its root, um, Nigeria, uh, you know, doesn't stand a chance. You mentioned that your father was a civil servant. And actually in the book, you say, you know, you had a comfortable living, decent education, as you mentioned, from uh, the school. But you said that also the damage done to the Nigerian economy, I believe in the uh, early 80s, had decimated living standards of honest civil servants. So going to the private sector was a no-brainer for you. But look, I've been following African politics for a while, and I know that we can't develop strong institutions and a government, and a strong government, that one that leads to change, if we don't have a strong civil servant. So how do we change this? How, do, how can we make sure, how can we change this whole mediocrity within the civil service and make sure that civil servants can also live a honest life for them and their children? Well, I would say that um, if I look at my life today and um, if I think about the triple bottom line that should concern any human being about what they do, in other words, uh, the profits you make, the planet you live on, and the people you interact with. So, I have devoted my life now to addressing this issue that you've raised. I believe that the only way of um, addressing Africa's challenges, and um, we must start with Nigeria, because if Africa is going to get it right, Nigeria must get it right. I quote um, Nelson Mandela. Um, we have to take Nigeria back to that time when the British civil servant the British government considered the Nigerian civil servant and the Nigerian government to be on par in terms of their effectiveness and their ability to perform. Now, Nigerians are high IQ uh, uh, citizens and so also for a number of other African countries. So it's not as if we don't have the talent. Even within the service today, we have brilliant young men and women, but they have suffered a huge underinvestment under, under in their welfare, in their training, in their leadership, in inspiring them and so on. So we have the Africa Initiative for Governance, which is one of uh, uh, my philanthropic uh, platforms uh, under the Aigi Mokwede Foundation. Uh, and together with my wife, Ufowe, okay, we've dedicated our resources to building this pool of outstanding civil servants. You know, um, uh, this business of uh, rebuilding uh, Nigeria and Africa is not a, a business for sprinters, and this is a marathon. Uh, and we have, you know, 20, 30 year time frames uh, uh, in mind, and indeed, actually, multi generational. We will hand this over to, you know, the next generation of of Aigi Mokwedes. But before, before, hopefully, in the next 20 years, we will go to 
from where we are now to us contributing about 4,000 highly trained uh, public servants to the Nigerian public service. Okay, fantastic. Look, there's a lot of questions that have come through on the uh, on the chat. I'll uh, I'll read you one, and it's uh, it's always a question that uh, that I've asked myself is uh, so how long did it take you to write the book, and how did you create the time you needed to write it? I mean, was this something that you wrote throughout your career at Access, or was it a post uh, post CEO uh, project? So uh, thanks for the question. Uh, whoever asked it, I started writing it around about the first quarter of 2014. I left Access Bank December 2013. And I said to myself that I would take, uh, I went back to school. Uh, so here is this CEO uh, um, who's uh, re you know, retired from an owner managed scenario, uh, fortunate and blessed by God to be part of an African unicorn story, which he part owns. And uh, I chose to go back to school uh, to do an MBA. Uh, I just wanted to, you know, leave that high horse of, of uh, what's the word, attention and so on, and just get into a classroom with younger people and, and you know, get attuned to the realities of life. Uh, and during that period, basically 24 months, that's when I wrote the book. Okay, so, so you did an MBA post, uh, post access. Yes. yes. Okay, and did you learn something from the MBA? Was it... Uh... Was it, uh, was it useful to you or was it things that you already knew in terms of governance, uh, risk management, uh, finance? So there were two parts of this learning experience. There was the part when my own knowledge and experience of, you know, professionally and life, you know, put me ahead of the class. And then there was the part about technology, new ventures, new business, new worlds, new ecosystems that put me at the bottom of the class. So, um, you know, great, you know, I had to, to, to look for balance, you know, give where I knew and take where I, I, I didn't. Okay, fantastic. Look, there's a question here from, uh, from Alina, uh, and it's about uh, lending to, uh, to youth and, uh, and women. It's um, how do we persuade African lenders to take on the risk to support uh, to support the youth and uh, and to women women led businesses and women entrepreneurs so i can talk about lending to women because i know um, professionally um, i know uh, a lot about it we are access bank is one of the pioneers in this field across africa and maybe you can argue actually in the world um, so i think it was around about 2005 or maybe even earlier, that we embarked on um, on uh, this uh, initiative uh, to for gender um, gender finance, the first African gender finance program. We did that with the IFC, and then it's just blossomed and blossomed and blossomed. Um, so the first thing is that generally women make better borrowers than men, um, and so and it's not a it's not the realization. It's not the challenge. Is not that banks don't know this. The larger societal issue is that if you live in an, you know, an Abrahamic world where um, the man's data is deemed to be more important than the woman's data, and the man's data is collected, the woman's data is ignored, okay, then of course you begin to have this uh, almost institutionalized discrimination against lending because you need data to lend. And these are some of the fundamental things we need to address so that women can you know, access you know, credit. Um, so why is it that many women actually own their assets or maybe things are changing now in their husband's name, for instance, okay? Um, why is it that many women can't have separate accounts from their husbands? I'm talking about when I got into the game, okay? Things have changed significantly you know, over that time. So um, there are fundamental barriers that have to be cured at the societal level. Now, of course, uh, banks that are sensitive to these societal challenges now can design ways to overcome those things. I remember, I'll tell you something. We took um, the first loan form that we designed for women, okay, for women borrowers. We actually took a template from, from um, I can't remember where, not certainly not Nigeria. And in it, 
okay? When we were, when I was reviewing the template that was sent to us, we were reviewing it. We had certain questions around the income uh, of the husband. And from a lending standpoint, you can understand why you ask that question, okay? Yeah, it's not, so it's not as if the question is not with merit, okay? But in truth, okay, from a credit worthiness standpoint, the question is irrelevant, okay? And so I'm just telling you how you have these institutionalized uh, biases that make it difficult for women to have access to, to credit. Suffice it to say, however, that I think that overall in Nigeria, with the work that has been done around sustainability, uh, with, the, with the assistance of development finance institutions and multilateral institutions, and um, um, with just a growing a grain consciousness by the Nigerian banking professional that, you know, there is a responsibility to females. You know, there is a better mindset, okay? Um, I kind of feel that to really shift the needle, however, we need uh, the type of uh, public servants that I've described, you know, coming up with policy that makes it impossible for lenders and data uh, managers, all right, to discriminate against women. I've got another, uh, thank you for that. I've got another question in terms of, uh, in terms of values and cultures from Stella Okudzu. And uh, she says, what specific tips would you share around defining and sustaining organizational value and culture? My thinking is that you did not fire all the access bank staff of old. So basically, you know, you came in, you bought a bank. You obviously have, what did, what did you do to change the, cult, the, the culture that was there? Because you didn't just get rid of the, the, those people and replace them with, uh, with your own team members. One of my, thanks, Stella. They're, they're, they're one of my, my favorite lecturers, uh, university lecturers, um, and this is when I spent uh, three months in Harvard, was John Cotter, Professor Cotter. Uh, and he's, he teaches leadership. And I, I can paraphrase his book, one of his books, I think Leading Change. Uh, it's obvious that I read, <laughs> I read uh, and I, I almost, you know, Anyway, but uh, leading change, and he, he says there are four, um, four types of people, so to speak, you will find in your organization when it comes to culture and the culture that your organization des desires or you, the leader, desire for your organization. You have those people who, you know, are completely aligned with the culture you seek and they want that culture. The next category are those who... Uh, believe in what you you are doing, but um, uh, could re need a bit of work for them to to really become uh, flag bearers of the culture. You then have the third group who you know are really neither here nor there. Okay, uh, they don't like it. They don't you know they don't care for it. Uh, um, uh, no, 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 not that they don't care for it. They don't like it. They are not neutral, okay, um, but they are not damaging. I mean, you know, you can win them over. And then you have the last category, which is the category that you will never win over. And, um, you know, John Cotter basically says, you know, you know, for that last category, get rid of them as quick as possible. So that is the real category that you do the um, exiting with immediately. They don't tend to be, well, Okay, they, they are not typically a, a great proportion of the population, but they could be very toxic to the culture that you seek to, to, to build. And then it's about working on the three other groups and your success is then going to be a function of how well, you know, uh, uh, are you able to move people from the status quo to the desired culture that, that you pursue. Great, look, I've got a question from, uh, from Rwanda here. Uh, Christian Bugabu, who's at the, uh, is an investment executive at uh, Growfin in Rwanda, country head. So he says, looking back and knowing what you do, what you know now, what would you do differently if you had to go back to the drawing board? Ah, great question, Christian. Um, I would have more shares in Access Bank than I have today. Fantastic. <laughs> okay, look. Um, 
Someone's written, uh, this is Charles, uh, Charles Eden. He says, in the author's note at the beginning of the book, you said you delayed the release of the book and would only disclose why if you ever write an autobiography. We're curious to know why, any clues. Basically, you finished writing the book, I think, in 2015, but you delayed the publication until uh, last, uh, late last year, early this year. So uh, are you going to reveal anything? No clues. Wait for my next book or wait for my autobiography. Okay, look, we've, uh, we've more or less run out of time. I'd like to uh, put one last question to you, if I, if I may. I mean, when you look at your career, people can say that it's a conventional career. What do I mean by that? I mean, obviously, you're a high achiever, but you graduated in law. You went, you went, you went to work with an established blue chip, so to speak. Uh, and, uh, and then you bought a bank. Obviously, uh, a lot went uh, to buying it and growing it. And this is what this book is about. But if you were... 16, 17, or even 2022 20, today, what, uh, what do you think, what career would you think you'd embark on? What, uh, how do you see things? Thanks, and it's a good way to, 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 to close our conversation. I think the first thing is that, um, look, there are no accidental African unicorns, or there are no accidental unicorns. I mean, you better master whatever it is, you know, you, you, you are going to go into, you know, as either before or as you do it. If you aren't the master of the game, you aren't going to um, uh, uh, succeed with that spectacular uh, um, result, you know, if we are using my story as, as a benchmark. Um, now, for me, uh, if I was 36 or even younger now, and I'm pursuing entrepreneurial um, uh, opportunity, I think that now, interestingly, you are more spoiled for choice than I was. The, and I will explain. You see, in our time, all right, our, um, our entrepreneurship for the professional was very much, right, subject-led. Subject-led, in other words, banking, finance, law, and so on. Go look at any of the stories, okay? That is if you're a professional, okay? And in Africa, there are not many manufacturing uh, stories around, if you like, um, the manufacturing process or a Greek process, okay? Because of that reality. There are not many, okay? Now, today, in the world we live, and the type of ecosystems that exist, there are opportunities to make billions based on your interest. So it no longer matters what you studied or what you mastered from a subject matter standpoint. What matters is what does your interest lead you to master? And if therefore, okay, my interests are in, for example, creating all right, an animation-based uh, 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 entertainment solution, all right, that can get millions of Africans paying for that content, okay? I don't have to be, uh, I could be a lawyer and find myself there. I could be a doctor and find myself there, etc. So for, you know, in terms of what to do and how to do it, wow. Um, First of all, I mean, obviously, let your interest, let your passion for that thing be completely overwhelming. There's no, there is no, um, there is no uh, compromising that. And um, go in for things that you can, uh, with friends and family, okay, establish your credibility in. And then, okay, the third thing is that. Uh, if you can call Aigujai Gimokwede and his investing platform, it would help. <laughs> Thank you, I. I mean, if you, when you read the book, what, uh, what you see is also planning is very important. Things like governance are things that you need to take very seriously. Making sure you've got the right culture, the right values. So uh, you, can't, uh, you can't mess around with that. So, uh, so the book is informative there also for, uh, for budding entrepreneurs in terms of uh, you know how to uh, how to grow a business, and that uh, you know you don't cut corners in this. Uh, uh, success, success is not a built is not built around cutting corners. So thank you all for watching.
so I think you can find everything in terms of uh, uh, reading reviews of the book, uh, finding book stockists, as well as information on the uh, on the foundation and uh, the internships, etc. That uh, that you offer. If you go to www.leavingthetarmac.com, and when you read the book, you'll also understand why uh, I chose to call it Leaving the Tarmac, which is uh, also an interesting anecdote. anecdote. But I'll leave that for uh, for you to discover when you uh, purchase and read the book. I thank you very much for your time. It's been a pleasure as always. Uh, thanks for the tips. I think our uh, our viewers enjoyed it too. So thanks and have a great day. Thank you very much, Omar. I really enjoyed this. Have a wonderful week. Thank you. Thank you.